Yeah. Right. Excellent. So, um, you've had just had a couple of great talks talking about how to carefully design your data visualizations, things you really need to take into consideration, how you want to plan through it and do some nice colors and work, work really well with it. I'm here to tell you something completely different. Um, I think you should be making data visualizations with reckless abandon. Uh, <laughs> take any of the data you have, visualize it, preferably all of it. Even the bits you think are really boring, visualize everything you have in different ways. And I think you should do it quickly and ugly um, because what I'm going to be talking about is not for communicating out to other people. When you want to communicate an idea, you want to do it clearly and well and make it very easy for those people to understand. And that's where the previous two talks will really help. I'm going to talk about using data visualization as a tool. So this is for you to improve your own data. Um, I'm going to be talking particularly about clean data. So uh, this talk doesn't have much color in. That's why I've given it a nice sort of hot pink background. That's, a, that's as much visual stuff as you're getting in terms of color. Um, I've just said clean data, and I thought it's really worth clarifying what I mean by that, because there are a couple of bits that extend out. First of all, um, if you're dealing with a data set and it's full of errors, then it feels like a bit of a stretch to say it's clean. That seems like a fairly standard one. We don't want errors in our data. We don't want to use other people's data that is full of errors. It causes lots of problems. Secondly, uh, for it to be clean, to me, it needs to be easy to process automatically. Lots of data sets are given out in a way in Excel spreadsheets and similar that are designed for humans to read. They have titles, cells are colored to indicate information, words are bolded to indicate further things. I can't pull those things out automatically. It's very difficult for me to process. So what I want, I want data to be easy to run through some code and generate visualizations and do analysis on. I want to spend as little time as possible pulling out the important bits from that data. Um, this is partly because I'm lazy, but partly because I work trying to pull together hundreds of different data sets, and I can't spend the time doing this. And as we uh, progress, we want to work with more and more and more data sets, pull in more and more things externally and build bigger things. And every little bit of friction gets in the way of us extending out. It gets in the way of us discovering new things from data. Thirdly, that builds on that, um, we want your data to be easy to link to other data sets. So um, we heard from Crossref earlier with the big push towards things like DOIs. If everyone who's talking about a paper uses DOIs, then we can link all of those data sets together. We can make discoveries about that that each individual person couldn't have done. We can only get when we link together all these various bits of information. So I want to make uh, for clean, a nice clean data source, I want where possible it's be easy to link to other data sources that talk about similar things. So you're using DOIs, you're using IDs that represent, uh, for me, organizations are important, um, any IDs to do with genes, proper names for things, CAS numbers for chemical elements, uh, for uh, chemical compounds and similar. Uh, so what I thought I'd do is I'd take through a bit of an example of using data visualizations to find some things in data that we want to clean up, find some problems. I'm going to look at journal articles because that's my bread and butter. I typically do work on uh, publications, what was published, when, et cetera, by who. So I'm going to take data from Crossref, and we're going to look at when papers were published, how many papers were published over time. First of all, it's worth thinking about what we expect. This is roughly what I thought would happen. So if we look at how many papers were published each year and chuck them on a graph, this is about the simplest graph you can draw. It's not pretty. I've barely bothered to try and explain anything on it. But this is the shape I expect to see, right? More papers are being published each year. That growth rate is accelerating. Nice big curve up and to the right, which usually means graphs are representing something good if they go up and to the right. Um, bits of noise and low down, maybe going back to sort of 1900s, maybe earlier. To bring in a bit of audience participation, who expects that I will get something different when I draw this for the Crossref data. Ah, good question. Um, so you think potentially because you're looking at DOIs, it might go back to uh, more 1980s, potentially somewhere around there. OK. Anyone else think there's going to be something different? So what are you actually going to be plotting? Uh, so we're going to take all of the articles that are in Crossref 
which means all the articles that have a DOI, and we're going to say how many were published each year. Yes. Yep, yep, one, two million. So I, I thought there'd be about two million being published. Two, like, so sort of one to ten million being published last year. You think it's going to be higher? Isn't she? Okay, yeah, sure. It's, it's, it's not too important. The, the most important thing of looking at what you expect to begin with is that so when we actually look at the data, we don't just explain it away and go, oh, yes, I expected that. Is that you want to put down something and go, well, I think it's going to look like this. And then you plot it out and you see how it looks different. And you go, and you can look for all the bits that look weird. Look at all things that are different. But so people are expecting something similar, maybe a bit stretched, maybe growing quicker, maybe going higher. So when I took out all the data, this is what it looked like. Uh, yes, correct. What? <laughs> so um, actually, the number of papers a few more. So in 2015, uh, almost three million papers being published. Um, it drops off fairly rapidly. But if you look at the years, you'll notice that year goes back to the year zero. Now, this isn't a mistake in me drawing the axes on this graph. The data goes back to the year zero, or there are things in with the year zero on the data. Um, so we can't really see anything. It looks pretty flat. Uh, now, that's going to come from that these things are going to be really, really small. There's going to be really small uh, bumps in this line. So let's switch this to a log plot. Again, very simple shift to the graph we're doing. These are just like two, three lines of code to get these things out. And we get this. So we switch this to a log plot, uh, which is really, really exaggerating the small things that we're seeing. So let's start at the far right. Year zero. We have, what's that? It's 1,100, about 1,100 papers with a year zero on them. That means someone, when submitting their metadata to Crossref, has said that they were published in the year zero. I've checked. These papers aren't from the year zero. But you never quite know what's going to have a, a publication. I mean, time goes back that far, and people have been writing things that old. So you, know, you, never, you never quite know. Um, that is likely to have come from a kind of error where someone has stored zero, meaning we don't know, which is very common, or someone's storing a null value, which then gets converted to a zero and then gets sent to somebody else, which gets interpreted as a date, which is zero, because it's a valid number. Uh, moving on, we get up to the year 1500 here, 1500. Um, again, like about 100, 100 papers or so in the year 1500. I looked at these ones. I am always suspicious of round numbers. Always be suspicious of round numbers in anything. They usually are some kind of problem. The year 1500 is staging data. So this is test data from a Japanese sedimentology journal who have a load of papers that start with the word dummy. So they have taken test data and they've submitted it to a live system. And that's where this comes out. If you can see slightly, there's another little spike there just next to it. That's the year 1665. So I went to see who'd managed to put something in at the year 1665. And it was these people called the Royal Society. So there are papers from 1665. And they are brilliant. I then, uh, in the next several hours, I was supposed to be drawing more graphs. I read those papers. <laughs> um, the title of my favorite one is, and I think the first one was, um, uh, some observations on unusual insects and the mischiefs caused by them. <laughs> so this is so that, that's really cool. There are DOIs going back to 1665 for papers. That's brilliant. If we move on, we start saying this. This is fine. This is just some noise going back around sort of dates we expect. Um, pretty standard line going up in a log plot. That's what we expect from it. This is our spike that we were seeing. And here, so about here is now. We've got papers being published in the future. And that's, that, that's not necessarily wrong, because sure, we might know when things are being published. And certainly going 2017 makes sense. 2018 may have things that are somewhat embargoed, and we, we can go on. But let's, let's stop from the other end for a start. Uh, that's the year 2203. Now, maybe some people have planned out that far. But actually, 2203, those ones, I, if I remember rightly, uh, look like typos for the year 2003 which suggests that a human has had a hand in this somewhere. Never trust humans. That is the <laughs> other big thing with data, never trust humans. Um, if we go back further, there's, there's very little or nothing really until we go back to about uh, 2100 and a little bit earlier. This one, I think, actually turns out to be a reverse Y2K bug. So I think some people have been putting some things in as 70, meaning 1970. 
this has been interpreted with something assuming everything was after the year 2000 and that this has been set to the year 2070 or similar. So, let's see. so I've, I've drawn two graphs here and one of them is just a log plot of something else and we've discovered a range of different types of errors. That was the, the really key thing. There are different types of errors here. There's data that shouldn't be there. There is um, uh, null values being converted wrong. There's potentially a Y2K bug. Uh, we have mistypes, other things like that. But with the Royal Society, though, it's important. We can't necessarily automatically tell that these are wrong. So visualizations are giving us the route in to look for where the errors might be. But it, it helps highlight some of the problems that we can find. I'd, I'd like to just clarify something here, though. The reason I've used Crossref for my example of finding errors in data is because Crossref are excellent for, certainly for the other two sides of it, but also the vast majority of data here, enormously vast majority of data here is correct. It fits in with the curve we were expecting. It all looks fine. There's 80 million articles and we found a few thousand that are wrong and they are errors in the submission that people have sent through. And there are also things we can't automatically detect and filter out. So this is an incredibly clean data set for things. They also make an API available. It's really easy to get the data, which is why I was able to grab it and actually draw this for you. So I wasn't going to spend days pulling out data in things. I mean, obviously, I'd put in the time and effort for the talk, but maybe not that much. Um, I thought, to, just to finish off, to actually see, see what's in it, let's cut the scale down. And let's look at things roughly in the year 1900 on. So this is the region we were more confident about. It's a lot more data. Um, straight line, about as we were expecting. You notice there are a couple of dips. And they're, they're, those dips last longer than I would expect for noise. So I wanted to see what might have uh, gone wrong there. And then I looked at the years. <laughs> those two correspond to the First and the Second World War. So you can see the impact of the war on, on the scientific output publishing. Uh, that's not to suggest that that was the the worst thing that happened. But, uh, it, but it's interesting to see those patterns appearing in the data. And it's a, another reason why we can't just look for, oh, when it goes down, it's wrong. Because those are, those are correct. Those are the things wrong. And let's pull it back away from uh, log plot, and we get roughly what we were expecting. With two minor ones that I would like to look into more, there is a bump at the year 2000. Remember, round numbers, always suspicious. Um, that is either potentially a slight issue, again, with zeros being interpreted. It might just be noise. Or also, uh, you can get issues. So Crossref is a combination, essentially, of lots of other inputs of data. If someone has only gone back to the year 2000 to submit their data, you would see a sudden bump there, in the sense that you are losing some of the data from previously. There's also a little, little kink around 2010. Um, again, I haven't been able to find a good reason for that. It may just be noise. It may be related to the financial crash. Maybe there was some drop in funding. Or again, uh, maybe that's someone submitting some of the data wrong. We don't know. But that, that, that's what we got. So we're able to find a bunch of problems. If we go to a single publisher now, again, we're looking at dates things were published. This is a heat map. You may notice there's not much heat in this. Um, I pulled a single publisher out and looked at the days of the year that they uh, had articles for. Blue represents articles. Um, gray and white represent basically no articles. You, you will notice there is a lot of gray here. Uh, almost all of their articles are marked as being on the 1st of January. And I checked, because this could be right. Some, some places mostly only publish once a year and the 1st of January kind of makes sense. Uh, but they don't. A lot of these articles are from December. They publish all the way through the year. If the people who submitted this data in had drawn a visualization like this, which is four lines of code, I believe, then they would have been able to look at this and go, well, that's not what I expected. We publish all through the year. Um, so yeah, that's, a, that's an incorrect thing. This is another category of error. This is a granularity problem. So someone has, I think, taken the year, stored it as the year, uh, like thrown it into a system and said, this is the year, but hasn't said, this is the year, and I only know the year, I don't know the month and the day. This has been turned into probably the first second of that year, which has then been passed on to other systems as of days. Again, this is totally valid data. It's just wrong. Um, or at least th those are valid dates, but, but they're wrong. So as a simple thing, data visualizations can make errors obvious. Oh, sorry. I, I don't know. Um, I need to look into those ones more. because yeah, they, uh, So if we go back, 
you see there are a bunch of things at the end of January and there's, there's other bits slightly in between. I was expecting all of them would be at the beginning or I would see a bunch of things at the 1st of January and then other minor stuff throughout the year because that's what's confusing there. So there's other things not on the 1st of January so they're not doing it all entirely wrong but they're not getting anything outside of January which is weird. So they've got days that are different but not months. That's quite possibly true as well. Yes, yeah, that's important. So you might want to shift some of the things because as you as you translate stuff, they go. Um, I, I was also confused. I was expecting potentially to find some of these where you got uh, all of the months filled in, but only up to the twelfth day, because you've got a format shift and you've written it in the, the American style or the incorrect style, as it's also known. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. So it's but it's interesting. It, it's great seeing people like spot more things and go, well, why is this? Why is that? And these are simple visualizations. They're very quick to do. And they, they can start leading you into finding some problems. So yeah, for, this is for the first step, just finding clean things. As I've spent 16 minutes rather than five. Um, uh, this one is going to be much shorter. I promise you this isn't going to be just a series of graphs and problems. I did the same thing for PubMed. I took the uh, Medline format, which is one of the formats PubMed make available. Um, and I plotted out the dates, or I went to plot the dates. Does anyone expect something different from what we originally thought with the graph going up and to the right? Yes, but nothing specific. <laughs> so maybe. Yeah. Because this midline is only biomedical research, it's going to be a convolution of the original DOI patterns on the DOI, the original after rate patterns, yeah. and the percentage that's in yeah. biomedical research. That's not the output I got. This is the output I got. So th th this is one. Uh, th this, is, this leads into the thing of human readable information, not machine readable. And this means I end up having to write bits of code that go, yes, fine, unless it says winter, that's not a valid date. There are also May, hyphen, June, and other things. Again, this is not a huge complaint against PubMed. Vast majority of the data is great. There are formats that pull out some of these uh, problems. And it is incredibly standardized. These are like gold standard data sets compared to the vast majority of things that are available. Um, and anyone who, work, uh, if people don't work uh, with lots of other data sets, that, that might be surprising. People who work with other data sets probably have war stories that they want to share with me later. Um, so that, that one's just a simple example of if you try and draw visualizations, that forces you to try and process all of your information with code. That means you will find places where you can't process the information with code. So you will find the errors that other people are going to stumble into in the data that you're sharing and you're releasing. It also means you will hopefully find errors if you do this early and often, which was the other part of the type, if you just keep making these visualizations as you're generating data, as you're recording stuff, you will find these issues early on, early enough to fix them without spending ages doing it. And they don't take long to run, they don't take long to generate, because partly because you don't need to take into, because these are internal, you don't need to take into consideration a lot of the more careful design you want to do when communicating externally. You can generate a graph and then throw it away, and you can generate another one and throw it away. It's, it's fine. Um, the remainder of the talk really uh, is the final step, connecting data sets together. Now, if you've got through the first two bits, then that's brilliant. You have a data set which is um, nice and accurate, which is a prerequisite for it being useful for most people anyway. You have a data set which can be processed automatically, which means I can write code and I can pull it in, uh, or other research because I can pull in your code. Um, but it misses one thing, which is being able to interconnect various things and ask questions that require us to pull in data from different places. So I'd ask you to think about connecting data sets together and um, using IDs wherever possible to refer to things. But again, one of the approaches for doing this is try it. Try and draw a visualization that links your data with somebody else's. And you will discover the things that make that difficult in your data. You will find that you use one brand name for a chemical and someone else uses another brand name for a chemical. And if only you both used cast numbers for this, then you wouldn't have this problem. Or uh, All of those kind of inconsistencies which stop these things happening often only get discovered really after the data sets have been released 
and somebody else tries to integrate them, finds out they can't, and then stops. But if you try and do them early on, you will find the things that let you do this. And you will also find loads of interesting things as well, I think, in the data, like seeing the drop in output over the world wars, because now I want to do some research into seeing can I identify purely from the research output from different countries when they had severe issues, either financially or um, with, with actual conflicts. Like, can, can we identify that? Interesting thing I might look at tomorrow in the hack day, if I can. Yeah. Um, so the connecting data sets, that's something that's really dear to my heart because this is what I do uh, day in and day out. I have to connect data sets involving lots of publication data, grant data, um, all of the things I'm well, like clinical trials and everything else. I want to connect them all together. I don't have time to take 200 different data sets and clean them all up. Um, or, well, it would be nice if I didn't have to do that, but that's why I've been just spending the last few years doing. Um, for this, one of the big issues we hit that we didn't have a good solution for is that people refer to universities and research organisations by name. Everyone writes down different names for the universities. Do you say Birmingham University, the University of Birmingham? Uh, so, uh, for example, Newcastle University and the University of Newcastle are used interchangeably, yet really one of them is in Australia and one is in the UK. Um, University College London, you would think, would be fairly precise, but there's one in Qatar. Um, uh, seriously, and th these kind of issues just expand out and out and out. So one of the things is we at uh, Digital Science built a data set, and it's now at 60,000 research organisations. Uh, it's called GRID, so grid.ac, if you do any work with research organisations and refer to them anyway, please come and check it out. It's completely free. Uh, the only licence requirement is that you uh, put attribution on. So just say somewhere that you use GRID. That's basically it. Um, and I will help you get started with it. It's free. Uh, Use it. Uh, that's that's mostly it for the talk. I'm aware I've run a bit over 20 minutes. So uh, finally, to fit in um, tools and approaches. So I've told you to go and do these things, uh, but how? First off, if you have stuff in Excel, export it as a CSV file. You can take different approaches, but this is one recommended thing. Try this and see if it works for you. Export it as a CSV file. Go and download something called R Studio. This will allow you to code in R or use Tableau or something. Um, I like our studio. You can use our markdown scripts, which allow you to mix uh, descriptions of your work and code and graphs and output. Uh, it really does take a few lines of code. All of the examples here, I think, are four or five lines of code. Most of it is just saying, draw a line, change this label to this, set this label to that, read in this data, use this other person's code, basically. Your output could be beautiful interactive documents. So you can output an HTML file, nice website with hover overs and lines that move and zoom and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, you just say, draw me a graph and use this library. And someone else has already done all the hard work for you. So, so just use those. Um, yeah, that, that was mostly it. The, the last thing I wanted to do, because I think uh, people have got off a bit too lightly in terms of audience participation for stuff, but is this. Who, who here has some data, is either recording some, working on some, or uses some in some way? So, two, three, yes, I know most, most people here, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to particularly pick on people, but most people here, I think, have some data. What I would really like you to do, and would heavily encourage, uh, because I can't actually require you to, I don't have that power yet, um, is speak to other people. Find at least one other person who has a data set which talks about the same types of things as yours. So if you are doing anything with gene sequences, find someone else who's working with similar gene sequences. Uh, if you're doing animal models, someone else who's working with other animal models. Wh whatever it is, find someone else who's doing it and do some visualization together linking those two data sets. Um, you, you will find it probably kind of difficult, but you will discover a lot of the rules and things that make it more difficult. It doesn't have to be a sensible visualization, right? It, it, it doesn't have to be something where you really expect to find something new or do something new. It's, it will usually either be kind of funny because you'll find a correlation between two things that are wildly uh, different, as the um, classic number of pirates compared to global warming data set shows. Um, 
or it will actually turn into something, but you will discover a huge amount of stuff on the way and you will meet some other people who are working in similar things. Um, that's, that's it for me, really. Um, yeah, uh, if anyone has any questions. Oh, uh, one final thing. Um, try this, try linking things together. If you have any problems or you just want to touch me, find me on Twitter or email me. I will try and help you out doing things. I'm around at the hack day tomorrow. Um, I will hand out things for Grid, and we're also releasing for free a data set of four and a half billion pounds worth of grant funding from 2014 for UK institutions to try and play around with tomorrow as well. So I'll, I'll share that around um, tomorrow for, for people. Um, yeah, that's me. Two minutes ago, uh, the good Zahian cow making the grid team proud. Oh, <laughs> so, is there any questions for Ian? Ah, yes. <laughs> at the back of I'm just going to point out 2000 is suspiciously close to when Crossref was founded. Ah, yes. Yeah. So, uh, often you can find things there, and they're not um, necessarily errors in data. One, something I didn't really talk about there is one of the usefulness, useful bits of doing data visualization is finding bits like that finding a, a reason, because it, it's not necessarily that the, the data is wrong in any way, but it might be something that you need to take into consideration uh, if you run any statistics or any statistical analysis of, of understanding some of the more uh, subtle aspects of your data. Um, so there, there seems to be something of a sort of contradiction in a way. So we had a talk earlier today about data repositories. So people are very keen on grabbing data, freezing it, sticking it somewhere. But the reality is when you get the data, it's full of crap. Yes. And so then people spend a huge amount of time cleaning it. So it seems to me, why are we focusing on this kind of frozen repository approach? What about a more dynamic view of data? A bit like what programmers do. You know, programmers have code that's dynamic, we edit it, we sort of play with it. Yeah. So there seems this weird disconnect between the repository approach and the actual reality of what we have to deal with. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I, I think one way of looking at some of that would be any... Uh, I, I'd like to see the rawest form of the data stored, because one of the problems is when you clean things, you can lose information. Um, it's generally a good transition, uh, but being able to trace things... I, I would like to be able to trace things all the way back to exactly what was recorded, and then understand what steps were taken to clean the data. Um, a, a lot of those might be things like, uh, I deal a lot with geographical data, so I will go through and I'll look for cities that have been misspelled, and I will assign them a GeoNames ID so I can more easily deal with them and things, and that, make, that would make the data set more useful. And I agree, like, storing those further forms, what I would like to see is a chain of stuff of going, this is the raw data, then we applied this step of processing to it, which is code that is stored and versioned and we know what was run, and that generated this output. And then we work on that data and we do something else to it and we fix and you could uh, track the whole thing. But I, I agree, I think there's a, there isn't enough focus on making the data a high enough quality to be reused by the people. Often the data, that's, that's not to disparage people who are making data and putting it out there. It's, it's great that people are doing this because, it, yeah, it's, it's just great that people are doing this. Um, and often the data will be very accurate and it will be very clean for the analysis that that person wanted to do. So often the, the data stored in it can be, can be excellent, but other bits which aren't as important to them for that analysis for their paper uh, won't time with other things. So if you uh, put down names of gene sequences or something, you can have a spelling mistake in that column because you're never processing it, you never hit a problem with it, it's not an issue for you, it doesn't affect your publication. You've still made your data available, and that's good. But we would want to have better normalized, uh, improved data for, for linking things together. Um, I, I certainly think, I don't know if there's a, uh, a problem with the approach of just getting people to put the data up, because that's a prerequisite of things. But I do think there isn't enough focus on making data uh, clean and easy to reuse in the same way that we do for when people write papers. We have editors that go through and check your paper and you know we do peer review and check that what you're saying makes sense and that things are spelled properly and sentences are correct and all that kind of stuff. We, I don't know if there are any um, systems set up for doing uh, things like peer review or review of code. 
I, I expect that there probably are, at least in an informal sense, in particularly, I know, like astronomy and bioinformatics have both been mentioned. Those are both, um, not to suggest that other sides aren't, but I know that both of those are excellent for um, dealing and processing with data because they are communities that have hit issues with data years ago and have had years to improve their, their processes. And now those things are starting to bleed over to other, other sides. Um, I don't know if that kind of answered I think, the question. Okay, so I think that's all we've got time for for Ian, but um, maybe you can catch him at coffee if you have any more questions. But thank you very much. Thanks.